Bonjour et bienvenue à l'ILARA, l'Institut des langues rares de l'École pratique des hautes études PSL. Hello and welcome to ILARA, our institute whose aim is to showcase the rare and precious ancient and contemporary languages of the world. Marianne Mithun's talk will be in English, but I'll introduce our institute in French first. ILARA est un institut créé en août 2020 par arrêté du ministère français de l'enseignement supérieur, de la recherche et de l'innovation. Sa mission est de sensibiliser et former le grand public aux langues rares, anciennes et contemporaines, et à leur culture. ILARA participe aussi à la valorisation et la sauvegarde de ces langues à travers des actions de documentation. Deux offres principales sont actuellement disponibles pour tous les publics. D'une part, une offre de cours d'initiation, de découverte et d'approfondissement en présentiel à Paris, et étant donné la situation en visioconférence pour encore quelques semaines, nous préparons l'offre du second semestre. Vous pourrez bientôt suivre des cours de langue bantou, une superbe série sur les judéo-langues contemporaines, une initiation à l'émessal et bien d'autres belles surprises. Et d'autre part, nous avons donc une offre de vidéoconférence virtuelle, l'ILARA en ligne, disponible sur notre chaîne et dont la première série, les invitations de l'ILARA, met à l'honneur des spécialistes de renommée internationale sous forme d'entretien ou de conférences. Dans ce cadre de l'ILARA en ligne, Scott Delancey a ouvert notre série d'invitations fin octobre en nous faisant découvrir les subtilités des langues d'Asie. Puis Nick Evans nous initiait aux complexités de la langue aborigène d'Alabon d'Australie, suivi de Félix Ameka qui nous présentait quelques joyaux linguistiques des langues d'Afrique de l'Ouest. Il y a deux semaines, nous découvrions la diversité linguistique du Caucase avec Bernard Comrie, et la semaine dernière, Bruna Franchetto nous donnait un aperçu des riches arts verbaux musicaux des Cuicuro de l'Amazonie brésilienne. Ce soir, nous remontons vers l'Amérique du Nord, sur cet immense territoire où sont parlées une grande variété de langues autochtones amérindiennes. Marianne Methun nous y emmène pour nous faire découvrir cette fascinante diversité. Professeur au département de linguistique de l'Université de Californie à Santa Barbara, son intérêt pour les langues amérindiennes remonte à son doctorat au moins, qu'elle a soutenu à l'université de Yale. Depuis ce travail sur le Tuscarora, elle a exploré de quantité d'autres langues autochtones d'Amérique du Nord, comme le Cayuga, le Mohawk, le Pomo central, le Chumash, le Yupik, le Navajo, le Cree, le Lakota, le Tutelo. Mais aussi des langues d'autres zones de la planète, comme le Kapampangan et le Selayare, qui sont des langues austronésiennes. Ce travail de terrain approfondi s'articule avec une réflexion typologique concernant les propriétés des langues et ce qu'elles nous apprennent de la faculté humaine de langage. Comme le dit Marianne elle-même, certaines des découvertes les plus surprenantes se font en documentant les langues telles qu'elles sont utilisées spontanément par leurs locuteurs, dans des contextes naturels et à des fins diverses, et en considérant les liens qu'entretiennent les unes avec les autres, la phonétique, la phonologie, la prosodie, la morphologie, la syntaxe et le discours, ainsi qu'en replaçant les langues dans leur contexte historique et géographique. C'est avec gratitude que j'accueille donc Marianne Methun pour un court entretien, suivi d'une présentation en plusieurs volets, entre lesquels vous pourrez poser vos questions en français ou en anglais. Welcome to you all. I will first ask a couple of questions to Marianne, then she will present several aspects of the indigenous languages of North America, organized into short developments, between which, or during which, you'll be able to ask your questions in the live chat. Please share your comments and participate. Marianne, we're so grateful that you accepted Ilara's invitation to present the fascinating indigenous languages of North America to the general public. But before you start your presentations, uh, let me ask you a couple of general questions. The first one, uh, you've spent decades of your life working on languages, in particular languages of North America. Can you tell us what triggered your interest for these languages? <laughs> Well, this is this is sort of interesting, um, as as some people know, particularly Jean Daniel. Um, I was a teenager in France, and when I was there, 
um, I couldn't help but be struck by the fact that at that time anyway, people who were speaking French were saying very different things from what English speakers would say in the same situation. And I, I, I kept thinking, my goodness, French and English are so close yet people are saying such different things. It must, what must it be like if, if you're thinking in a language that's totally different? And that's really what triggered my interest. So it really was France. <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> so we hope that you can soon come in person to France and uh, and relive <laughs> this um, experience. <laughs> um, another question I have is about um, working on uh, contemporary rare and precious languages, which uh, involves uh, working with speakers. And um, I know that there are many ways of going about that, depending on the researcher. And so could you describe how you collaborate with speakers and uh, tell us about some people um, who are particularly important to you? Uh, thank you, Amina. Um, I've just been extremely fortunate. I think things have kind of happened accidentally. So um, I, I, I went to Yale, which was um, very serious and everybody was doing Indo-European and um, I was still kind of intrigued with what might be different. And I was very fortunate. I raced up to the uh, anthropology department and there was a very erudite professor there. And he said, well, I can't help you unless you interested in North America. And I said, okay. And he said, and I couldn't help you unless you're interested in Uruguay. And I said, okay. And he said, well, there's one language that people haven't really worked with. And I said, okay. So um, that began, that was Tuscarora. And I was very fortunate to work with a wonderful, wonderful speaker who, he was a wonderful speaker. And he was um, already in his late seventies at the time. And we just had a wonderful time together. Anyway, and while I was finishing my degree, um, um, people in Quebec, you probably know this, um, Quebec at that point was uh, bilingual and um, of course a Francophone majority and the Francophones were sort of beginning to rise up and say, wait a minute, we deserve more respect here. And um, Iroquoian people there were noticing this and saying, say, you know, if they deserve more respect for their language and culture, we do too. And they marched on the government and said, we demand um, university courses in, in Iroquoian linguistics. These guys are very smart. And so um, the government sort of said, well, and I got a call and it said, you will get on the night train and you will come up to, and so I said, sure. And that was the beginning of a wonderful, wonderful side of my life that is still going very strong. These were people who were um, very, very good Mohawk speakers who got this thing going, extremely good Mohawk speakers. And they sort of woke up one morning and realized that, um, the kids weren't learning the language. It sort of happened all at once and they were completely surprised. So good speakers went into the schools to try to teach the language. These are very good speakers. And so they sort of said in Mohawk, you know, pine tree and the kids still didn't speak Mohawk. So they said, okay, maybe we need a little help here. And that's when um, I, I went in. And so together over the years, and it's still continuing to this day, we're in contact all the time, which is really, really wonderful. Um, we together um, came up with an orthography and came up with a curriculum um, sort of year by year for these speakers uh, to, to teach. Again, very good speakers, but of course, part of being a good speaker meant that you hadn't gone off and gone to school. Um, and then um, I got a call one day and they said, Marianne, what's this thing called immersion? And so um, I told them about it. They said, oh, well, that sounds good because we just got some money for that. And so they instituted immersion, Mohawk immersion schools, where um, in this community, um, when children are four, um, parents decide whether their kids will do all of their learning in English or in Mohawk. And um, this is not an easy thing. You have to take the entire curriculum, the Quebec cur curriculum, and render it in another language. And you, it's very interesting because it makes you think, okay, am I trying to get exactly the thoughts or am I trying to stand back and say, you know, what's, What's another way of thinking about this? And so these guys are absolutely amazing. And they've done this right along and they've produced fluent second language speakers 
speakers. And with a language like Mohawk, nobody, not the speakers, nobody thought this could be done. It's absolutely astonishing they're they're absolutely amazing and so they would go through and then and then they would um get to the end of that schooling and um oh i should say uh, and so the quebec government of course was testing these kids at every every moment and it turned out that the kids in the mohawk stream tested higher in everything including english um which of course attests you know the value of being bilingual um, and Mohawk is their second language. Anyway, so these kids went through and then they sort of um, realized as they were young adults that they missed the Mohawk. And so they're so enterprising. They found money to have um, Mohawk immersion classes for adults. Um, and what this does is um, they, they, they had 200 applicants the first year for 20 places. And it's been going ever since. Um, basically the money pays you uh, um, to be in Mohawk for your full-time job, five days a week, all day long, um, speaking Mohawk for a year. And this has produced adult second language speakers who are fluent. It's absolutely astonishing. And this has been going year after year. And then they said, you know, to be really good at this, we really need a second year. So now it's a two-year program. And it's absolutely stunning. It's produced speakers and, and community scholars who are as sharp as, as anybody could be. These guys are really amazing. Anyway, so I've been very fortunate to be sort of <laughs> be riding along and, and helping out. And um, then other communities um, sort of saw what they were doing and, and jumped on. So I've been, I've been working with a lot of other communities. Um, and, and right now, you know, we're, we're all meeting um, several times a week for several hours on Zoom. So um, it hasn't stopped. Uh, yeah. <laughs> wow, this is really super exciting to be able to see the results of, um, of this over a number of years. Uh, do we have, oh yeah, we have greetings from Isabelle Brille, from Jean Daniel, <laughs> François, Colette Grival, Tom Durand, Nancy Kaplan. Oh! Uh, salut mes amis. <laughs> That's really nice. <laughs> yeah, I think you have a warm and friendly audience. <laughs> so um, I can tell you one more thing about one other. Please um, do. Oh, okay. I'll let you. Shall I? Um, this is a, a completely different situation. This is um, Central Pomo. So this is Northern California. Um, and I was, I was teaching at Berkeley at that point, and um, I got a call. Well, no, actually, my teaching assistant said um, her husband had just been driving down from the California coast and has stopped in with a friend who's an anthropologist and um, said, you know, there's this language that nobody's really done anything with, it's Northern California. And, um, and maybe you could call this number. So I called, of course, I called the number. It was a woman, a speaker of Central Como, who said there were only two speakers left of her language, herself and her mother-in-law, and um, something had to be done right away. And um, <laughs> this was a Friday, and it was kind of the last day of school. So I said, well, um, uh, OK, um, want me to come up? She says, yes, and you'd better come up by tomorrow morning. So <laughs> I knew very little about this language. There'd been a little bit of work on related languages. I just kind of noticed that it had a lot of consonants or that related languages had a lot of consonants. And um, so I hopped in the car and she said, meet me at the Bluebird Cafe. So I, <laughs> there was one place in this little town, only one place, there was a gas station in this place and it said eats. So I went in there and everybody said, oh, hi, Marianne. And um, that was the beginning of that experience. Um, so there were only, so, so Francis and I worked for a little while and I said, well, what about the mother-in-law? And she said, oh, she's mean, she's really mean. And then a little while later, Francis walks in and she says, well, that's it, she's dead. And I said, no, you're the only speaker. She said, yeah, yeah, but she was mean, so that's okay. And so I sort of explained to her how much we wouldn't know if we didn't have conversation. Oh, <laughs> we'd been <laughs> meeting in the Bluebird Cafe for the first uh, couple, well, the first day. And of course it was right on the highway and there was a fan and people were coming in and out and there were dishes. And I'm thinking, okay, 
ejectives versus aspiration versus uvulars and velars, um, you know. <laughs> she said, would you like to find a quieter place where we could work? I said, yeah. Said, okay. So <laughs> she fixed it so that we could go to the nearby town and work in the mortuary, which was very cool and very quiet. Um, anyway. <laughs> We did that for a little while. <laughs> and um, then I, I, I explained about not having other speakers to talk to her. I said, you know, we're just going to miss out on so much of what you know. And she said, okay, go get the phone. So I got the phone. And um, she said, dial this number. Sign. And then she goes, whoa, 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 whoa. She said, okay, hop in the car. She, she was a take charge woman. She'd been tribal chairman. We hopped in the car and um, <laughs> drove over the mountains, <laughs> 50 miles to the coast. She goes up and she knocks on a door. Woman opens the door. She's <laughs> anyway, she'd been saying, um, hey, you know, you, we, we got to do something about this language. And the woman had said, no, no, I'm going shopping. And Francis said to her, I found out about this later. So you got a lot of money. What are you going to shop with? Um, and she says, well, no, we're not really. Francis said, I think this lady has some money. And so, because I had a grant at that point. So, um, and, and so she's okay, come on in um, just for a little while. And um, we spent 12 hours there <laughs> recording and talking. And ultimately, we kept doing this. And ultimately, we came up with a dozen speakers. And we all, we worked all worked for nine years, documenting nine years of conversation because of Francis, who was this go-getter? And then I, I lived with Francis. And so we'd record and then we'd come home and then she and I would transcribe and translate. And she was a dynamo. So that's just one other very different kind of situation. But um, it's, it's because of these people who are so forward looking. Yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Sorry, uh, there's a uh, something uh, on the screen. Hi but... guys. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you'd like lovely. To tell us more about those languages by saying because we it it seems like um, there are so many language families in the area and so many different languages. So up to you. Thank you. Okay, shall I jump in and talk about how many languages there are? <laughs> okay, um, but let me first say, um, feel free to jump in with questions and comments in the middle and um, either I'll see them in chat or I mean, I will we'll do something. So feel free to jump in in the middle. I'll, I'll stop at various places. And um, so comments too, it doesn't have to be a question. <clears throat> comments are just fine. So I'll share my screen. Okay. Okay, so you can all see that, right? Okay, let me, um, okay. So um, <clears throat> this is, um, I mean, I asked me to talk about languages of North America. So sorry, some of you know about this very well, um, but I'm assuming that not everybody does. So sorry if I tell you stuff you already know. Um, so this is about North American languages north of Mexico. We don't know how many were here to start with. Um, probably a number disappeared before there was a trace. We know of about 275 languages and that's very rough just from that we know we're separate languages. Um, and you might think, okay, North America is one thing. It's not. There are around 55 completely distinct genetic groups that is that are descended from different common ancestors. So we talk about a language family as all the languages that come from one ancestral language. And over time, as people kind of move off, languages continue to change, but they change in different ways and ultimately become mutually unintelligible. So English and French are Indo-European languages. Um, <clears throat> as are most languages in Europe, but then um, anyway, so these are completely different. Um, the genetic groupings of the families um, are various sized. So there are probably about 26 isolates. That means 
there are no known relatives. They're just there. So Zuni is an example, and there are a lot of other ones. There are a lot that are kind of small, um, some two, some three, some five, six, seven, all the way up. So two, the Tumashan family, which is um, right here in Santa Barbara, um, has six languages. The Salishan family, which is in the Northwest coast, has 23 languages. Um, Yudu Aztecan language family is big. That goes down into Mexico, 31 different languages. Um, the Diné family, Athabasca and Yak Tlingit, has 37 languages, and that extends from Alaska all the way down through British Columbia, Alberta, um, formerly Washington State, Idaho, Montana, Oregon, and then down into the um, Southwest. And they vary in documentation. So some of the languages, we just have a little word list. Um, other languages, we have some pretty good documentation. But of course, it's erased against time because um, we're losing so many really good um, uh, elders. Um, so here, you can't see this at all. That just shows you there are lots of languages here. I know you can't see that. That's just to sort of tell you there are lots of them. Um, you can see there's a whole bunch here on the Pacific coast. They're very, very dense. Um, in the plains, it, you know, they're, they're much bigger. Um, it sort of takes more land to, um, to get your livelihood from buffalo, whereas here you just kind of reach your hand in the water and get nice shellfish. Um, this shows you um, major languages, kind of roughly, major language families. So I was telling you about um, Diné, Athabascan, Iak, Tlingit, that's kind of here, and then down here in the southwest, um, we've got Suin. Look at all the density of, of different genetic groups here in the Pacific, uh, along the Pacific. Um, here's Iroquoian. Anyway, you'll see more of these, but the idea is there's lots. And the point is, they're very, very different. People might think, oh yeah, North American Indian languages, they're all the same. They're not. They're very, very different, which makes it all the more exciting. Okay, there's something that's called a linguistic area. And that is when you have especially small languages, but it can be bigger languages. If you have small communities, um, people very often, the smaller, <laughs> the more likely marry outside the community. And if they're marrying people in another neighboring community and those people speak a different language, you very often get um, multilingualism, bilingualism. And so if you've got people that have two languages in their head, um, those languages can't help but affect each other. And um, some ways it's obvious in some situations, some places, um, you get a lot of vocabulary borrowing. Other places, especially North America, you don't get very much borrowing of vocabulary, but there are other things that come in and we'll see this a little bit more. If you're used to speaking one language and in this language, people are very careful about certain kinds of distinctions. For example, maybe in this language, people are always specifying location very, very carefully. You go and you speak your second language or your other language, and maybe you're gonna be very careful to try to speak that language, not to draw stuff in from this first one, but maybe you're gonna to try to kind of, you, you wanna keep talking about space and location and that can have an effect on that language over time if you have very heavy multilingualism. People are gonna be specifying um, location a lot more often. And when people specify something very frequently, it ultimately becomes part of the grammar. So that means you can have languages that are neighboring they're not related genetically, but they can share a lot of stuff. And when that happens, we have what's called a linguistic area. And we have some of those in North America. Um, this is the, the culture area. So this, this is um, sort of an anthropological thing. People talk about the subarctic, the plateau, the Great Basin. Um, some of these are um, kind of strong linguistic areas, particularly the Northwest coast. So there are a lot of shared traits among language families that, you know, they're not related genealogically, but um, they, they share things. Um, another very strong linguistic area is California and sort of the neighbors. So up into Oregon and over into the Great Basin, that's a very strong area. Another very strong area is the Southeast. So those are quite strong linguistic areas and languages that are not related to each other have developed 
some similar sort of deep seated similarities. There are other weaker areas. The Southwest is a little bit weaker. Um, the Plateau, Great Basin, um, <laughs> not so much the subarctic. Okay, um, anybody wanna jump in? Yes, Amina. Yes, sorry, there's a question uh, by Alex Francois. Okay. He says, or it's a common question, those of us who don't know North American languages have a hard time imagining how diverse they are, surely a lot, versus how typologically similar. So any insight on their diversity is very instructive. Oh, thank you, Alex. That's a, a nice question. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think if you, um, <laughs> Yeah, if you just look from far away, you say, oh yeah, they got lots of stuff in them. Once you're in the middle of them, um, you find they're really, really different in a lot of ways, particularly in the kinds of distinctions they make. Um, one thing that you see in a lot of languages, but not all of them by any means, um, is, um, and I, I'm gonna talk about it, polysynthesis. <clears throat> so a number of the languages, uh, particularly um, in this area, so um, Arctic and then the subarctic, um, you can get words with a lot of pieces of them. And you get that too in the Northeast with Iroquoian and Algonquian, less so in the Southeast, there's still some, not at all the same here. And you get that here, but, but the distinctions are very, very different. And they're interesting theories, some of you know about this, um, and we don't know whether they're true or not, about how you develop these very long complex words. Um, and one, one theory, which is quite interesting, is that if you're in a small um, community where the same people talk to each other all the time, so this is like not New York City or Paris or something like this, you've got the same interaction, People sort of tend to use the same patterns of expression over and over and over. And when you have this high frequency of certain patterns of expression, it can get routinized. Your mind sort of processes it as a chunk. And when that happens over a long period of time, that can give you a single word with lots of pieces in it. And the idea is if you have, um, it's, it's quite different um, if say you have a lot of people who come and go and they've got different patterns of expression and maybe you've got adult, adult language learners who aren't learning things fast, um, so you don't develop that. That's a theory. We don't know whether it's true or not, but it's an interesting theory. But what's interesting when you get into this, and I think, I think uh, Alex, this is a really good thing that you know very well too. If your documentation just consists of saying, how do you say John hit Mary, which you shouldn't do anyway, um, you're never going to discover what the language itself does. You're going to see what people do when they're trying to translate your contact language. So kind of, I think appreciating the huge differences really depends on having good speakers talking to them, each other and deciding what to say rather than putting words in their mouth. Thanks, Ali. That's a nice, a nice point. Um, any other thoughts? Yes, Amina. There's another question. Isabel asks, could you say a little bit more about the Southeast area? Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> so this is the Southeast. As you know, um, the, this is the main family here is Muscogean. And you've heard of some of these languages, probably Choctaw, you've probably heard of, maybe some of the other ones, not so much. Um, and that's a family, okay. Um, and then there are what are called Gulf languages. And these are little languages, they're language isolates like Natchez and Tunica, um, uh, Pacapa, various things. Um, and people thought for quite a while that it was all genetically related, not because the forms are the same, but because they share certain deeper patterns. And then you look and there are also, um, you can, this is Suan, well, this is a lot of stuff, but um, there's a Suan language family, which kind of, well, it's, it's all over the place, but there was a lot of contact here. So these languages share a number of really interesting features. Um, one of these is what's, and no, I, I didn't put it in this talk, um, what's called agent patient systems. So instead of having subjects and objects, they group part 
happens in terms of what are grammatical agents in patients. So for example, if I jump, I'm a grammatical agent. If I sleep, I'm a grammatical patient. And you use two completely different forms for the I. Okay. And you can see this in, you know, this came, came in, I think, well, we, a good possibility from Suen. So you see this in Suen languages, you see this in Muscogean languages, and you see this in all these little um, isolates. Um, there's several other things they have in common. Um, one is what's called switch reference. So when you're putting together sentences, you're talking about whether this thing has the same, this is where subjects do come in, have the same subject as the next one. So it's a little bit like in English saying, crossing the street, I saw um, a man or something like that, but you're very carefully um, tracking reference. And, and again, the different languages use different forms. All of the Muscogean languages use the same forms, but, um, but they've got the same kind of patterning. Then there's another kind of thing, um, which uh, I think did come in from Suan languages. And um, that has to do with being paying very careful attention to position. So you distinguish things that are standing from things that are sitting from things that are lying. And you can see this coming in and, and affecting the grammar in big ways. Yeah. Okay, any other? Yes. Not for the moment. I think you can go on with the sound system. And okay. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So just a little bit. So you can see what the sounds are like. Let me show you a little stuff. So um, here's Iroquoian. Okay, this is Cherokee down here. This is where Tuscarora was up until 1712. Um, this was Susquehannock. Then you have Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca. This was Huron. Um, yeah, and, and, and more has happened since. Anyway, so now we're gonna look at Tuscarora. These guys came up from here in 1712. Um, they're at Niagara Falls. You've probably heard of Niagara Falls. This is. It's really rough doing field work here. It's just, it's really, really a terrible place to, to do. Anyway, um, look, it hardly has any consonants. So it's got to, 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 to interesting, to, in order, you know, glottal stop. That's not very many consonants. Here, you can, you can hear what it sounds like. Okay, I'll let you see. Um, this is from Elton Green. Okay, okay. He, he was such a good speaker. That's him. Okay, so you can hear what that sounds like. Um, now for Eskimo Alu. Okay, so this is this family. Um, it's called Eskalut. It's also called various other things. It extends from Siberia, you don't have Siberia here, all the way across here um, through Northern Canada, uh, Labrador and Greenland. So it goes as far as the east, Eastern part of Greenland with Greenlandic. So it covers a pretty wide area, um, very different kind of landscape. Okay, look, it's got more consonants and some of the interesting things, it's got a difference between um, oh, th these are the, the community, the conventional spellings, and then here is what they sound like in sort of IPA. So you have uh, like a K, it would be like Ka, but a Q would be like A. Ah. And for speakers, those are two completely different sounds. Okay, there's also a S, um, which you don't get just everywhere. Um, and you have, you know, and um, so these are different. There's a, a particular verb in, in Yupik for um, a second language speaker who doesn't know how to distinguish the K and the Q. It's a particular verb. Room. Anyway, um, so here you can hear what it sounds like. Um, this is George Charles. So pay attention to the Qs and the sh. Um, there's more going on than the H. Um, so this is in the practical orthography. That's a sh. Yeah, I'm um, yeah, he, he was talking to his sister um, on the phone. <laughs> Anthony. Okay, that's George. Okay, 
Now, um, this is the Diné family. Okay, Navajo is around here. You've heard of Navajo. Um, very different uh, topography again. It's got more consonants. This again is the um, standard orthography um, and it's pretty close. Um, some of the interesting things, it's got ejectives, which you find um, in, especially yeah, in, in North America. So, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Um, it's got the sh and then it's got la. Um, so, um, oh, and it's got distinctions between, it's got tone. And it's got a distinction between nasalized vowels and like those are nasalized and plain vowels that's nasalized and between long vowels and short vowels. So long vowels you write with just two vowels. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. That's Dolly. Okay. Great speaker. Okay, here's Pomo, and I was telling you about Central Pomo. So this is Northern California, that's San Francisco right there. It's again, quite different. Um, the, the, this language is spoken in two main communities now, one on the coast and one inland. This is the inland one about, yeah, 50 miles inland. It's a beautiful place on the coast. Okay, it's got more consonants, it's got 30 consonants. So it's got a distinction between dentals like da and Alveolars like ta, you say, whoa, or ta and ta, or ta and ta. Okay. And if you make a mistake, speakers have no idea what you're trying for. It's like in French, if you said a P instead of a T, people wouldn't say, oh, yeah, she just doesn't have her P's and T's correct. It's like, oh, we don't have a word like that. Um, and it's got, ja. it's also got the velars like ga versus a. Okay, but it's got aspirated ka and ka and ka and ka. Okay, and it's got shoes and okay, so it's got a lot of nice stuff. Okay, so here you can hear it. Listen, there's an um, alveolar aspirated, there's um, a dental ejective, um, there's, then, yeah, okay, there's, a, there's um, an ejective. Many English tomorrow, tomorrow. So she was talking about um, these um, basha. These are like big. They, they're like um, they're like huge chestnuts, and so um, yeah, kind of like huge chestnuts. Um, and of course, this is the kind of thing that kept people um, eating over the winter. Um, anyway, so that's Francis right there, the one who called me up and said, "We gotta, we gotta do something about this." Um, and that's one of the speakers we found in a neighboring place. They were a lot of fun. Okay, now, what about the area? Well, actually, there are differences in the area. So I was telling you about the East. So Iroquoian languages, Proto-Iroquoian, we reconstruct 10 consonants. Um, Algonquian languages, 13 consonants. Muscogean down in the Southwest, 17 consonants, okay. California, Central Pomo has 30 consonants. Lake Miwa has 31 consonants. Wichamni Yokes, I just grabbed these, but they're quite mm, sort of normal, has 32 consonants. There's kind of an aerial difference here. Okay. Um, yeah, Hupa, which is Dene, has Baskin, has 34 consonants. Um, now, so this is the Algonquian family. This is a big family. This has got a lot of the languages you've heard of. So a Blackfoot or Apple. Oh, um, yeah, all languages you've just heard about, all kinds of languages you've heard about. Um, so they're, they're, they're kind of east. They, they moved off to the east. This is Algonquian. They're part of a bigger group called Algic, which has two little relatives, very remote relatives here. The idea is that um, people came down and, and sort of split up, and then these guys came here, and then over time, groups started moving this way. So these languages are quite closely related because they were together until they got here, while these two languages on the California coast are as far from each other as either one is from any one of the others. So Puerto Algonquian, these are the, the consonants we can reconstruct, okay. Um, and here are the distant California relatives. There's Wiat and Yurok, okay. <laughs> 
So yeah, lots of consonants. <laughs> Whoa, you know, and they're related. What happened? <laughs> well, okay, this is Northern California. This is um, San Francisco right down here. This is the California Northern uh, Oregon border. Okay, so this is Northwest California. These are all different languages. Actually, this is a whole family. Um, <clears throat> There's one of these algic languages, that's Yurok, the one that was down there on the left. That's Wiat, the one that was down there on the right with all those consonants. And look, there's their neighbor, Hoopa. Okay. There are the Hoopa consonants. Okay. So obviously something was going on. So that sort of shows you just in terms of sound. Um, yeah, aerial influences. Okay, anything else anybody wanted to add? Yes, Amina. Yes, we have several comments and questions. So in chronological order, there's Alex uh, Francois, who says again, great point about the routinization of phraseology. Totally agree. Reminds me of your inspiring notion of nameworthiness. I guess it can be an aerial thing, what is considered nameworthy or not. Thank you, Alex. That's a really nice comment. I totally agree. That's really, really a nice comment. Yeah. And uh, then the Steve Hewitt says the three families, Algonquin, Hi Iroquian, and Siouan, all seem to have spread towards the southeast, Virginia, Carolinas. Do we have any idea of the relative chronology and geography of their spread? Um, let's see. I guess I can't get back there. Um, no, um, it, the, the, for Iroquoian, um, I think if I went back, I, I, I probably, well, I can take you back. Let me take you back to Iroquoian. Let's see. <laughs> da, 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 da. There's, okay, so this is Iroquois, and as you said, this is Cherokee. So what we know is that um, Cherokee is the most differentiated. So, so we don't really know, but it looks like Proto-Iroquoian had to come from somewhere here. And then very early on, um, there were estimates of 4,000 years ago, but we really have no idea. So the estimate is 4,000 years, who knows? Um, the Iroquoian split into Southern Iroquoian, which is now um, just represented by Cherokee. If there were other, uh, other sister languages, we don't know. And then Northern Iroquoian, and that kept moving. Okay, Northern Iroquoian, the next big split, and the estimates are like 2,500 years ago, but who knows, um, it was Tuscarora and everybody else. And so these guys were Tuscarora were down here. And then after that, the next split was Huron, now called, called Wendat. And these guys were first seen in Ontario, Southern Ontario. Um, and then after that, the five nations, and those are all here. Um, and then we can even see within that, that there were a split, there was a split in Seneca Cayuga, and Onondaga and Susquehannock probably, and uh, Mohawk and Oneida, which means that Mohawk and Oneida are very close and Seneca and Cayuga are pretty close. Um, and then there's this mystery language, which is quite interesting, um, which is now called Laurentian. So you probably know that in uh, 1534, Jacques Cartier um, sailed into the Bay of Gaspé with his um, men looking at the new world. And he came up the St. Lawrence and he saw these people um, settled on the banks of, well, actually he said, so who are you? And they said, you know, I mean, there wasn't a lot of mutual comprehensibility at this point. This is the, the first thing, this is probably the first language um, North American language documented in, um, anyway. And he said, well, come on down. And, and so along the St. Lawrence, there were people living there. And um, so they very kindly gave Jacques Cartier and his crew some cedar so that they would, wouldn't get scurvy, et cetera. And, um, and there were some notes in the ship's log, in Jacques Cartier's ship's log uh, of words, um, which is very interesting to us anyway. Way. And then what he did, he went back, but before going back, he grabbed two people from here and took them back to France, where they lived for a year. The next year, 1535, Jacques Cartier came back again with his two captives, and they went up to Montreal. And we have a list of words appended to each of these ships 
accounts. So the 1534 voyage and the voyage and the 1535 voyage of words from this language. And they've just kind of been sitting there for a while. But now we can look at them. Of course, there are plenty of challenges. It's very clear they were Iroquoian. Um, in 1603, Champlain, Champlain came back and there was nobody here. They vanished. So the question was, who were these people? Okay, well, if you know what you're doing, you look at the vocabularies, you say, this is Iroquoian. Um, so it was Iroquoian. Um, and furthermore, we can see that um, it wasn't just one language because there are sound changes within the vocabularies that aren't replicated. So we can see that several different languages were represented. Um, and of course, it's, it's very fun to look at um, what, the, what they thought the words meant and what they really meant. Um, like, <laughs> like there's, there's one that's translated bronze. And you say, well, that's kind of interesting. Um, well, it turns out what the translation, what, what the Iroquoian says is it goes around your finger. So obviously one of these sailors had a ring and he said, what, what do you call this? And he said, well, it's going around your finger. Okay. There's another one that was translated somon, salmon, and um, didn't look like any word for any kind of fish in any language I knew. Um, but then I looked a little further. It's the word for a tray, a, a platter kind of thing. Obviously, somebody pointed to a platter with a fish on it and said, what do you call that? And he said, well, that's, you know, mm -doc, that's a platter. Anyway, there's a lot of, a lot of fun going on there. Um, and of course, we don't know, it wasn't Jacques Cartier who wrote these things down. So we don't know who was the one who wrote them down. Furthermore, of course, um, French orthography hadn't quite settled down at this point. So if somebody writes an S, were they pronouncing an S or did they mean vowel length or an H or what did they hear to make them write that? So anyway, it's been a lot of fun. That's more than you wanted to know about this. Um, as for, uh, let's see, I mentioned Algonquian. So I don't know, these guys are very close. These are very remote. These are further apart. I mean, you can just see the sort of, the further you get east, the closer the languages are. There's kind of central Algonquian here, eastern Algonquian here, and then Algic. For Suan, there's some Suan out here. There's Tudelo, um, and then there's Osage down here. Um, yeah. Um, and then, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I guess that's probably all you want to know about that. Yeah. <laughs> Let me go back to Oh, this is so fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You get the review this way. Yeah, if it went by too fast the first time, it goes by too fast the second time. Okay, <laughs> any other questions or thoughts? There are other questions. It also reminds me of what you just said about uh, elicitation. So it's, it's a kind of also a kind of, um, elicitation problem in those days. And <laughs> yes. so, uh, yeah, we have um, another question by Ed Pedraza Robles, who also says, also always a pleasure to hear you speak, Professor. So that's oh, a nice. comment, but the, um, the remark or question, Thomas Fier remarked, Tonkawa was typologically unusual in the USA in that it exhibited switch reference, obviation, and definite articles. Any other languages that you feel are unusual for America? Oh, I think all of them. <laughs> that's good. And, and I should say that the, the obviation, that's of course Algonquian, um, but you see stuff that's like it, but not like it in other places, like in the Arctic and the switch reference, you see stuff that's like it, um, in a lot of places, but not like it. Um, so people assumed, for example, that all switch reference was subject, 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 so that's that. And of course, if your elicitation again is John sang and Mary danced, it's working fine. Um, if however, you let people loose and let them talk, you find that how they're packaging information isn't necessarily subject. In some languages it is. Um, in others, it's not. It's how people are packaging what they're putting together as one event versus multiple events or multiple points of view. Um, yeah, there's a, there's just lots and lots and lots and lots, I guess. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes, the diversity is really amazing. And also in the soundscapes that you just presented, yeah. it was so nice to hear all those languages so yeah. clearly. So thank you. So maybe, yes, I think for, for oh no, Scott has, oh. um, um, he says, Chinookan has grammatical gender. That's pretty odd for the new world. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and of course, we've got ergativity up there too, which is kind of interesting. Um, yeah, so it is quite unusual to have grammatical gender. Um, but there are a few little places where um, we get elaborate gender. Actually, um, in Iroquoian, it's quite interesting. Um, and I could talk for an hour, but I, I will speak spare you that. Um, what's very interesting in, in um, Iroquoian is you started out with just first, second, and third persons, and then an indefinite for people, okay? And it's still that way in Cherokee. Um, then you go up um, into the north, and it's still, it's still that way pretty much in Wendat here on. Then you go to um, the Five Nations Iroquois, and it's quite interesting because what happened was that, um, oh, that, um, for North, I should say, for Northern Iroquoian, they introduced a masculine gender. So that meant you had first and second person, and then you had these indefinite people, and then you had two kinds of third persons. You had the new masculines, and then you had the others, which were things and animals and people. So you have one gender that, I mean, women, things, animals, and women versus men, okay? And it's still like that in Huron. But then when you get down into Five Nations, um, people started using that indefinite one um, for special purposes, so for, to show respect. So if you're talking about your grandmother, you would use this one, okay, or your mother. So your grandmother and your mother. And it's still pretty much that way in um, Mohawk and Oneida and Onondaga. Um, it's used a little bit for a few more people than that. But people you're showing sort of special deference to. Okay, um, it went a little wild in Seneca and Cayuga. Now they just do that for all women. Okay, but it's very, very interesting to see you've got these two feminine genders, this ga, which is objects and animals and some women versus the ye, which is indefinites and other women. And what's very interesting is that um, when I first started working with the uh, Mohawk teachers, I was showing them this and they were horrified. They had no idea. I mean, they're beautiful speakers and they do it all the time, but they're, they were shocked that there were, that the, they were using the same prefixes for animals and some women and the indefinite for other women. And one woman who was very proper stood up and she said, this is not right. We have to stop this right now. She said, we're never gonna use this God prefix for women again. We're gonna only use the indefinite prefix. And my friend here agrees with me. And when she said that, when she said my friend here agrees with me, of course she used the zoic animal prefix rather than the in indefinite prefix. Um, it, it's very interesting. Um, people had never thought about it before because of course they weren't reading and it's kind of a, a literate thing. So I had a lot of fun asking everybody. I mean, we've had years and years of fun dinner table conversations about who do you, who's a yeah and who's a ga. Um, and of course people differ a little bit. Um, uh, we were in a, in a cafe and, and they said something about, you know, oh, ask the waitress to and they used ga. And I said, why do you use ga? Well, we don't know her. Um, which was interesting. Another useful thing is that um, this is Canada. And so people had pictures of Queen Elizabeth on their walls and what they called her is Ga Queen, which is the Zoic prefix. Yeah, okay, more, <laughs> that's enough of that, right? <laughs> Anything else? Okay, no. so um, <laughs> talk about polysynthesis, yeah? Okay, um, so languages in North America, some of them have fairly complex words. So here we go with Mohawk. Um, this is Latsanina. She said, I mean, they were talking. She said, oh, they make excuses. They were talking about why some of the kids weren't coming and learning. And here's how she said it. Okay, this is pretty common. It's got pieces in it. So you can see all these pieces in it. This is not unusual. 
Um, this is an optative masculine plural agent, middle voice, reason, linker. Um, it's a verb meaning to prop up or something like that. This is an instrumental applicative. This means nothing to some of you. Epenthetic vowel to keep the W and the glottal stop apart. That's the perfective. Okay, literally is they would cushion it with a reason which is kind of nice here. You can hear him saying it. I mean, this was part of a lively conversation. Did you get that? I'll do it again. <laughs> okay. Um, and this is why um, I brought up that, uh, I mean, asked me for something to put as a title. Um, I was on a car trip with a Mohawk friend and we were driving along and she says, you know, she says, I don't really speak English very well. And I said, what? Because I think nobody who didn't know Mohawk would have any clue that English wasn't her only language. I said, your English is flawless. I mean, it completely flawless. It's like, like where she lives, but she said, no, no. She said, I really don't speak English. As, I don't know English the way I know Mohawk. And I said, what makes you say that? And she says, well, when I speak Mohawk, I have all these pictures in my mind. And she says, that doesn't happen with English. <laughs> which I think is actually quite revealing because I, I see what she means about Mohawk because there are all these pieces that have what have been called shadow meanings. So yeah, you know, yeah, that means they're making excuses. But there's this little thing in your head that has some of these pieces in there and they have varying degrees. Speakers, speakers themselves have varying degrees of consciousness of them. It's not a, a, a literary and analytical thing. It's that like they know about this cushioning thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's like these things. And so I thought that was a, a beautiful comment and I completely understand what she meant. Um, yeah, that's what she said. Um, uh, this is what's in Nina. She's the one, they, these guys do nothing but have fun. They, they play with the language. It's, it's total fun. Um, okay, here's uh, Yupik. You saw Central Alaskan Yupik. Here's another normal word. You can see it's got a lot of pieces. Uh, mind, lack, think, subordinative, um, the same. This is the one I was talking about to first person. Also, what does that mean? And he thought I was stupid. Okay. So, yeah, that's got lots. That's uh, Elena. She's a wonderful speaker, tiny little lady. Okay. Here's the Navajo. Um, oh, you didn't see this before. Okay. It's got pieces. The thing about Navajo is so often the pieces don't seem to add up to the real meaning. Here it does. Um, you found it. Okay, you can hear it. Okay. Um, <laughs> so this is a verb to paw. And this is, oh my goodness. Okay. Um, but the whole thing is he found it. He was, this little kid saw them buy jelly and put it away for the night. And he thought about it all night. And he got up in the middle of the night and found it. And he was just eating it. He found it anyway. So they got up in the morning and it was gone. Okay, here's central pomo. Um, I think you saw this word before. This is heat, sense, cause, perfective, imperfective, plural, passive, and perfective. They have to be cooked. She was talking about basha, those um, buckeyes, those things. Okay, um, there's something called holophrasis, and this is something you find in a lot of North American languages, but certainly not all. Um, a verb can be a complete sentence. Um, because in these particular languages, all verbs contain pronominal reference to their main participants. So you've got everything you need, who did it and what they did. Um, so here's Mohawk. He says, yeah, okay, normal word here. It's got its pieces. Um, future, third plural acting on, so they to us, spark, linker, set, benefactive, applicative, perfective. Oh, I didn't put the sound on here, sorry. Um, what that meant was um, he was saying, oh, welcome to the new ele newly elected counselors. Um, they will we'll meet on our behalf. Um, okay. And he meant they'll meet on our behalf. But look, you've got the, the spark in here, but you've also got the they for us. So that's a perfectly good sentence on its own. And it sounds like that. Um, here's the Yupik. That's the one you just saw. And he thought I was stupid. It's, it's one word and it's fine. Here's Navajo, you just saw that. He found it, one word, and it's fine. So um, in a lot of languages, certainly not all, you can do that. Okay, any, any other 
thoughts at that point? Okay. Um, so what goes into these words? <laughs> well, the interesting thing is they're not all the same. So um, here's just a sample of Mohawk. This is a, a <laughs> generalized sample. So you can get a lot of pieces. You always have to have pronominal prefixes, who, who did it to what, who, and you always have a verb root, what they did. And you always have aspect, like did it happen all at once? Did it take a while, et cetera, et cetera? Is it over with? Um, but then you can have a whole bunch of possible prefixes before that. You can have stuff in here and reciprocals. You can have a bunch of stuff here. You can add on here. And here's what they look like. Here are the things that can go in here. Um, here are the things that can go in here. <laughs> and then you've got various aspects and you can do a progressive or a remote past or a former past or a continuative. So there's plenty of stuff. And of course you can do lots and lots of noun stems and lots and lots of verb stems. So I'm just gonna show you one little piece. This is just one of the prefixes. This is a repetitive. Um, <laughs> this is good. Okay. Um, what you should notice in this story, I'm only gonna give you a little piece of it. Um, you wanna pay attention to how she's using the repetitive. It's just a little prefix. It's just an S or an SA or a TSI. Um, and the thing about Mohawk speakers is if, if, so, if, if an event is happening again, or you're returning to an earlier state, they put this in there very much more often than you might if you were speaking English. Okay, so um, the point is you've got this thing and it's there because people did it so often. So it was this frequency that led to routinization and, and that frequency continues. And of course, it's so easy to do, it's right there. Um, so she was telling the story. I'm not giving you the whole thing. It was all in Mohawk. She says, a couple bought some chickens and built a chicken coop. They enjoyed hearing the rooster crow in the morning, but one morning the chickens were screaming more than usual. So the husband suggested that something must be after them and the couple went to look. The husband looked through a hole in the wall and saw that something had gotten a hold of one and it was screaming. The wife suggested he get his gun. She's the wife who was talking. Um, it was a weasel. It had already bitten the chicken on the leg. The husband took aim and shot. The weasel looked around wondering what had happened. Okay, so I'll give you a little piece of this. So um, then this weasel, he just grabbed onto the chicken again. Okay, since it's the second time he grabbed it, she's got the za on there. The chicken really screamed. Okay, it was the second time this chicken had screamed. So he re-screamed. Okay. Again, my husband took aim. He Rescreen, we re aimed. So here you can. <laughs> okay. The weasel just looked around again. Okay, he'd looked around once. You got to say again because it was the second time he did it and took another bite out of the chicken on its leg. He retook a bite. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What did they want to call it? Okay. Um, Mohawk almost never borrows words, but this is a borrowed word, and I bet nobody here knows what it's borrowed from. Um, Mohawks are now um, in a, Quebec, Ontario, and New York State. They were earlier on um, in New York State um, around the Albany area. And the Dutch settled there and they had a fort called Fort Orange. And the Mohawks heard the Dutch calling their chickens. And of course they hadn't had chickens when they got chickens, so that's what they called them. So gip, 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 gip. okay. Mohawk doesn't have labials, so they put in T's instead of the P's. Okay, that's I'm the speaker. Um, any anything to stop at this point, Min Amina? Yes. Yes, maybe I have a, que a question about this repetitive, which is really fascinating. Um, is it absolutely systematic or does it, uh, of course, it needs the um, action to be repeated, but does it happen each time it's repeated or does it happen or is it included when uh, this, repetition, this repetition has to be underlined or highlighted in some ways? Thank you, thank you, that's a nice thing. If you wanna underline it, there's this other word here, this are 
So if you really want to, and it's like that with all these little pieces. So if you want to make a big deal, you use a separate word. But notice, even though she's got the art, it, oh, here's again. And then again, when the art, it, you got this art. It. Oh, here. Yeah. Oh, she did a lot of the, these things. You don't have to do that. But um, yeah. Um, and um, it, it's used in places where English wouldn't do the repeating. So like um, another time somebody was talking about um, this guy, he lost his wife. And so he was um, looking for another, <laughs> another woman um, and he wanted to remarry. And so, and so they married. And so he found one, they two married and she used the repetitive, even though <laughs> It wasn't the same person he was marrying, <laughs> but it was they two married. So it gets used much more, but that's a really nice point. All of these little pieces that kind of get tucked in without a thought, if you really want to um, make a big deal, you use a separate word as well. Yeah, so she could have just said he he took aim, um, but she wanted to say, my, my <laughs> this is the way you, one way to say my husband is, I have him as an old man. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, any other? Okay, so something that you get a lot in North America, but certainly not in every language. This, you saw this before. This is, they will kindle the fire force, they will meet on our behalf. So you can slip a whole noun stem inside of a verb and Mohawks do this a lot. Um, <laughs> um, and there's something we talk about as linguists is productivity. Um, people had thought sometimes when they, first saw Mohawk for the first time, oh, you just take any, any object and you just put it in the verb. And it's so frequent, you think that at first, and then slowly you realize, no, no, that's not how it works. Um, it's very productive, that is, you see it all over the place. But the productivity, it's not just do it all you want, it's that um, certain nouns get incorporated a lot, some incorporated now and then, some nouns just don't get incorporated. Okay, same with verb stems. Some verb stems incorporate things a lot, some can or not, and some never ever do. Um, and speakers know this, so they kind of know what you combine and what you don't combine. And you can sort of see reasons for this um, because when you put a noun in there, it sort of narrows the meaning of the verb. So certain verbs that are very general um, get a lot of incorporation and certain verbs that have very specific meanings don't get much incorporation. That's sort of how it works. Um, it's a word formation device. So Mohawks, <laughs> except for a few of those very early um, Dutch loans, that's kind of only one of them. There are a couple more. And a few Quebec French loans, they don't borrow things, they make up new words for things. And so um, when you want a new word for a new concept, very often you get it, but people know what the word means. Um, but it's also in Mohawk, not all languages that have this, it's used very skillfully to manipulate the flow of information. And Mohawk speakers are really good at this and good speakers are especially good at it. And it gets used for other stuff. Um, so here, lexicalization for name worthy concepts. Um, so somebody said, yeah, they told him to remove this drunkard. Okay, so how did they say they told him to remove this drunkard? They told him, okay, this is how you do remove they should bodily cause him to be carried, okay? So they're incorporating this stem for body, meaning you're gonna physically carry him out. This drunkard, the way you say the drunkard, it's a verb, he liquid overdoes, okay? Um, habitually, yeah. Um, now, this is really something that good speakers do beautifully. And that is when you're first introducing something, a referent, very often you'll use a whole separate word, a noun or whatever, okay? But then once it's on stage and everybody's kind of got that in their mind, then you just tuck it into the verb to kind of keep it going, but you don't have to keep jumping in and, and, and. So you can see this. So this was um, a daughter, um, and, and a mother, and the mother was telling the daughter how to make meat pies. This is something they do for celebrations. Like when you're having a wedding, you make huge numbers of meat pies. This is very, very traditional. Um, so the, the daughter was learning from the mother how to make meat pies. Um, and so she says a little flour and then fat. So she's bringing in the fat here in this guy. She'd said, what do you put in there? And she says, oh, a little flour and fat. Um, she's talking about the crest here. 
and I myself refer to melt the fat. So this is really beautifully done. So first, she, the first time she mentions the fat, it's here. And then the second time she mentions it, it's incorporated here. Um, what's interesting is it's not even the same word for fat. This is the, the one you incorporate. And uh, this one, it's by itself. So you can hear her. Yeah. This shows you again how you use a separate word to contrast or something. So here she says, I prefer, that's the I. But here she's got a separate pronoun only just because, well, I myself, but other people don't. Um, then um, Jerry says, well, how much? And um, her mother says, well, you'll decide how many pies you're making. She incorporates this baked goods thing because the whole topic of the conversation is making pies. <laughs> Notice the way you decide is you've got this uh, brain insert here, which is kind of nice. Um, and the meat and potatoes, she says. Well, while you're waiting, you'll cook the potatoes and the meat's cooking. Okay, so the daughter brings in the meat and the potatoes as separate nouns, and then the mother incorporates the potato and the meat. Then, oh, what? Then, oh, 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 then, um, yeah, and good speakers do this all the time. And so if a speaker incorporates something and people hadn't heard that word before, everybody knows it and everybody smiles and everybody loves it. And people are always saying, you go, uh, gotta go talk to what's his name. He's a really good speaker. And what that means, it doesn't mean he doesn't make mistakes. It means he knows how to manipulate the language. Um, these guys, okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, so Gayadidake was, we were talking about when we first got together and, and how many years it had been. And of course, we were saying to make it sound like it, we weren't that old, that we were just little children when we started working on this. Um, and so he says, now you have a big plate. All those up so long in there. You know, what? <laughs> what in the world? <laughs> Okay, it's because we were, we were, we too were children little, so that's incorporating child. And he's incorporating plate, and it sounds very similar. So it's a play on the incorporated noun. I mean, you know, you got to be quick to do this. <laughs> so that's them. Okay, so we can see um, so sort of Iroquois languages, Northern Iroquois languages have <clears throat> a really vibrant incorporation. Um, as you can see, people do it a lot. Um, there are languages where people still do it, but not so much. Um, and then there are like, like Siouan languages, it, it, people don't use it for the discourse purposes, but they use it to make new words. And then there are languages where it's not going now, but we can tell by looking at it that it was really there. <clears throat> so, you know, maybe after a while people, you know, they once had it and everybody was doing it, but then people move on to other stuff. But if you're if you're sharp, you can kind of still see it. So uh, this is Muscadian. Um, this is Choctaw. Okay, I told you they're in the southeast. But as you probably know, in the 1830s, we had a president who um, forced Native peoples to move west, um, which was a terrible thing. So now there are a lot of Choctaws in Oklahoma. Um, we can see traces in Choctaw. Um, so if you look inside verbs, you can see this ok or nok for neck or ibi or ibak for nose or face, yosh for hair or head, okay? But only ok still acts like an independent noun in Choctaw. Um, we know about these other ones just because we can look at related languages, other Muscogean languages, and we can see them as nouns in those languages. So here you can see some Choctaw. <clears throat> 
There's a verb to have sunken eyes. Okay, and there's the eye. Another verb to close your eyes. No surprise, you've got the ok. And then there's a verb to be thick or viscous. And this ok also means liquid <clears throat> or to sink. Okay, and here's nose. And here it is in have a nose bleed. And here, this is the hair or head one to roll of your roll and to be bald. Okay, so we can see it was once there, but it's not there anymore. Um, here you can see, this is just, you know, I, I just color these in. These are languages where it's now productive or you can tell it was once there. So like for um, Diné languages, in a lot of these languages, it's still productive. In um, the Southwest, in Navajo and Apache, you can see it was once there. The pieces are still there, but aren't doing it anymore. Um, yeah, there's Muskegon, there's Iroquoian, there's Sioux. Okay. Um, yeah, now, so if you have this construction where you make compounds and noun incorporation is when you put a noun and a verb together, what can happen over time, you've got these compounds that have a noun root and a verb root or a noun stem and a verb stem in either order, depending on the language. Over time, when people use that word, they stop stop thinking kind of about the pieces to some extent. And one of those, if this thing gets used a whole lot, it can start to kind of shrivel and become a prefix or a suffix. Um, but when it's very young, it's still gonna have pretty concrete meanings. And we can see this in a number of places in North America. Um, so remember that he thought I was stupid. Okay, this is a noun root here. This is now just a suffix to lack. It can't occur in, in, um, in these languages. Every word has to start with one and only one root and you can't have, you don't have compounding anymore. And then you've got lots of suffixes. Um, this language has about 500 of those suffixes and another 500 of these suffixes. It's got lots and lots of suffixes. Um, anyway, so you got a noun root and then you have a verb root that means to lack. You have all kinds of verb roots with very, very concrete meanings. Things like to wear or to buy or to go to or to, yeah, lots and lots of to, to hunt. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I like this word. It smells of dried fish. Okay. We have a noun root fish. And then we have this nice suffix, which means this is um, Steve Jacobson's definition, which I like departed from its natural state. Um, and then there's this suffix unpleasing. And then we've got this thing that was once a verb root. Now it's just a suffix to smell or taste of. And you get a nice, <laughs> nice word. It smells of dried fish. Yeah, you can see all that stuff. Um, okay, Algonquian. So remember Algonquian languages. Um, now we're looking at Inu, which is in Quebec, also called Montagnier. <clears throat> so I think it earlier had compounds, verb, noun, so kind of noun incorporation. But now these nouns have shriveled into suffixes, but they often still have quite concrete meanings. Um, so um, this is from Mine Drapeau. Uh, my father shares out fish. It started with a verb root and then a noun root, but this is now a suffix. So it can't occur by itself. Like that. Um, okay, here are languages that have these descendants of noun incorporation. So where um, something has turned into a, a prefix or a suffix, but still has concrete meaning. So you have Algonquian, you have um, Salishan, you have Eskimoan, you have Wakashan, um, Chimacuan, a little bit here. Yeah, so you can see, yeah. Um, here are the languages that have both you know, modern incorporation or descendants of incorporation. Okay, so yeah, that kind of goes pretty far. Um, okay, um, questions or should we stop? Yes, there are a few questions uh, by Fanny Muschenbled. So, uh, first of all, about the repetitive suffix, but maybe you'd like to answer this later because it's a bit earlier in the talk. She said, can this repetitive be repeated like again and again, or like oh. the in French? That's a nice, that's a nice question. Absolutely not. Thank, thank you for that question. Um, it, it turns out that um, 
there are sort of two different kinds of morphological structure here. So Mohawk shows you one kind and Yupik shows you another kind. Um, in Mohawk, any prefix or suffix has one and one only place in the verb. It's got to be there or not. So you can't build it up. Absolutely not. So, you know, you get there, you choose to do it or you don't. That's it. You can't do it. Um, the Yupik and, and the, um, the everybody in that family is a little bit different. So you, you can only have one root, <clears throat> but you can put keep putting things on. It's like you have this bucket of suffixes and then you can pull out a new one and add it on and throw it back in and put other stuff and add it on again and throw in other stuff. So you can have past tense and then another past tense, or you can have them in the other order, or you can have future and a past or a past and a future or a past and a future. You've got suffixes that mean like, say that. Okay, so you can have a verb like he says, she'll come. And then you can put a past tense on it and you get something like, um, he says, she came. Or you can put the past tense on the other side and he said, she'll, she's coming. Or you can put them both on, he said, she came. Anyway, so yeah, it varies with the language. Thank you very much. Uh, Fanny has other questions as well. One of them is, are separate and incorporated forms of nouns always different? Can the incorporated noun be considered as a root? Is the separate form morphologically complex? Thank you. Excellent question. Sounds like you know what you're talking about. Um, so it, it varies with the language. Um, <clears throat> in Iroquoian languages and probably most languages, what you incorporate is a stem. So that might be a root or it might have other stuff on it that built it up like that. But you couldn't use it by itself as a word. And in fact, if you asked a speaker, so you get a really good speaker who does this like crazy. And if you said, what's, what's the incorporated noun? Well, I mean, you'd say it, you wouldn't say it like that. They say, I know there's a fish in there, but I don't know where it is. They couldn't pull it out for you. In Iroquoian languages, all nouns have a gender prefix. <clears throat> They're always neuter and a noun suffix. And those you don't pull in. So when the nouns are by themselves, they've got this extra morphological complexity. And then you only pull in the, the stem. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. And she says, um, it made me think of the absolutive form of nouns in certain uto astican languages, a suffix that disappears when the noun is incorporated, yeah. possessed, or other processes. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, <clears throat> and of course, for Iroquois too, you can have external, you know, when you have a separate independent noun, you can have a possessive prefix on there too. So it's it's quite similar in that way. Um, but of course, in Udo Aztecan, there are places where you get the noun on its own without that absolutive. But in Iroquoian, you could never say a stem by itself. Nobody would have any clue what you were aiming for. Yeah. Hmm. Great. Okay. So go ahead. I'll, I'll do just a little bit more. Um, I know it's hard to sit still. Uh, for this long. So, um, but I can't tell if you get up and go, so that's all right. Um, question is, what goes into roots and affixes? Okay, remember Central Como, this is California. Um, here's this verb, it's got, I can tell you, actually, I didn't tell you, this is a um, another suffix, but this is this verb, which means to sit on a thorn or put a patch on pants. Okay, that's kind of interesting. And here's another verb, which is to block, if blocking a doorway. And here's jakal to finish peeling as apples or potatoes. These are the, um, the definitions given by speakers. So the question is, what's the morphology here? What do these pieces mean? Um, huh, I don't know if it's obvious to you. It wasn't obvious to me to start with. Well, it turns out there's a prefix. This ja is a prefix and it means involving a massive object. <laughs> uh, for example, but also in cutting. <clears throat> so, wow. So what in the world are these things? <laughs> okay. Well, here are some verbs. That's the first one you saw, this dot et. Um, 
here are some other things with this root. It's also, um, <laughs> this was when we were sitting in that restaurant and this came up, some, she felt under the table. I don't know if this has ever happened to you. Anyway, this is to stick something on with fingers as chewing gum under the table. Um, this is if you, you're drinking something and you get a bug in your mouth with it. Um, this is you step on a nail or a thorn, okay? This is you stick a pitchfork up in the ground or a shovel. Um, this is you're pushing on something and it sticks in your hand. This is to catch fire. This is not obvious morphological analysis. This is you hammer a nail into the wall, okay? Uh, you, something's floating down river and it gets stuck on the riverbank. So catch, <laughs> yeah, something into a box. What in the world? Well, it turns out this root etch is to stick together or be alongside of each other. There are all of these prefixes that give you sort of means or manner um, or something involved. Um, so this was like the heavy object. This is fine finger action. This is like sucking or swallowing or liquiding. This is a kind of stepping. There's another one for kicking. Um, this is thrusting, like also it's in the verb to, if you salt your food, um, this involves fire. There's another one. This is like palming. This is this dye you get if you're um, parting your hair. Um, this is flowing. You get the idea. Here are a few more. You saw that other verb, jackal, finish peeling, jackal, win in a game. What in the world? Okay, I'll come back and tell you about that. To steal. What, you know, what, what, what? Okay, all is to finish. How do you get this? There's a prefix, I don't, some of you may know about California culture um, from, from the beginning of time. Um, Californias have a culture of gaming, gambling. And there's a prefix that means by gambling. And so this is, you finish everything off by gambling and that's how you get the weaning in a game. Um, yeah, here we, we saw the jack on. On is to block. Okay. So the thing is, you get these prefixes all over the place, but you can't just make them up. Um, people use them for name worthy concepts, and then speakers know what exists. They could exist, but doesn't exist. And they know which would never exist, which is very interesting to me. So we had this thing, okay? And uh, it's like poking, thrusting, jabbing, throwing. And all is like you get it and finish a task, finish sewing, finish peeling, finish the sewing thing. That's this verb to encircle, I mean, prefix to encircle. And so you get it for sewing like that, finish reading. But there's no h huh plus good. So there's no all. But no surprise, why would you have a verb to complete poking? Uh, you know, it just doesn't exist. <clears throat> and furthermore, all this doesn't occur anymore on its own. So it's very important to know what speakers do, not just what they could do. Um, yeah, speakers are coined. I mean, terms are coined. Um, so I'll, I'll hear a verb and I'll see what it means, like skel. And I know that this is by pulling clean. And so I'll ask what it means. And here's what the speakers say. That's to weed a lawn. How about clean with fine finger action? That's, you know, Marianne's understanding of the meanings of these things. That's pick pebbles out of beans before cooking them. Bayak, orally recognize. That means follow an order. That call, finish off by pulling. <clears throat> That's the thing is to swipe or steal but only in some dialects. Okay, um, so one last thing here. What about word classes? Um, here we go back to Iroquoian, but I'm looking at a different language. They really work about the same way. This is Cayuga. This is now spoken in Northern Ontario. I mean, Southern Ontario. Um, it's a beautiful place. It's on the Grand River. Um, and in all Iroquoian languages, uh, Northern Iroquoian, you'd have just three lexical categories and you tell by their morphology. So particles don't have any internal structure. You can compound them. So geek means this pertains to what people have been saying. Nouns like that's the neuter part. That's the noun suffix part or verbs. I'll have a look. Okay, that's all you have. But if you look at what people actually say when they're let loose, um, I just took one thing that had 400 words. 
there were 245 particles, 10 nouns, 245 verbs. And that's really typical. Okay, so here's Reg talking about rabbit hunting. He says, you gotta keep your eyes peeled. Okay, so how did he say this? He said it like this. Okay, you've got your nice incorporation there. This has got this neat phonological thing I can't resist telling you. If counting from the beginning, you've got an odd numbered syllable that ends in an H, you devoice it. <laughs> if it ends in a glottal and it's odd numbered counting from the beginning, then um, you do an eject glottalize it. Okay, anyway, um, that's a verb, that's a particle. Okay, you'll follow its tracks. It's hiding its tracks. For a particle. You can hear that. You can hear that you're not hearing. Okay. Seems like the tops are getting shorter. How do you say that? That's because it's in its tracks. Okay. It'll stick its head into the loop. He's made a, a loop out of a sapling and, and he's placed it so that the, the rabbit's running around and you he knows where it is because of the track. And it goes through and then it, the sapling picks it up. That's red. Wonderful speaker. Why so many verbs? Well, you got the pronouns inside, so you don't have to have pronouns outside. Um, nouns are incorporated a lot, as you saw, and a lot of things you just say in verbs. Also, um, verbs can be used just the way they are, like nouns, as referring expressions. So, how do you say put your coat on? That's how you say it. <laughs> So yeah, the wheat, it is, those are the pieces. Okay, that's what it means. You cause yourself to be bodily encircled. <laughs> there, it's a verb. There's no coat in there, but the word for coat has the verb inside, it's based on a verb. Thing that encircles one's body, a coat or shirt or a dress. Okay, um, other things that we would say with nouns, Iroquois speakers don't say with nouns. Family and friends are relationships, they're not possessions. So my uncle, Haknotze, this is still Kiyuga. He is uncle to me, it's a verb. My son, Ehawak, I have him as offspring. That's my son, it's the verb. My cousin, we two are related to each other. My cousins, we all are related to each other. Each is related to each other, okay? And you coin new terms for verbal descriptions. Um, and you don't have to even nominalize them. So, you know, what's going on here? Here we go back to Reg. He's talking about a guy he saw doing this. <laughs> okay. Twice soon, do you have Okay, um, the, the noun for shoes is actually a verb. I didn't put that on here. It means what you, what you, <laughs> you're shod with it. That's what it is, it's a verb. Okay, but here, this is the high-topped boots, but it just says they're high-topped, it's a verb. So as you can see, uh, yeah, they use a lot of verbs. So the point here is that people don't even sort of put their ideas into the same categories in different languages. Um, now, I think that's probably enough of sitting still, so I'm not going to go here, but see if there's other questions and other, other comments. On this part, we don't have any additional comments. I think everyone was dazzled by uh, the wealth of uh, information and all the various combinations and it's uh, like fireworks really <laughs> so I don't know if anyone yeah sorry you would like to add something I don't know if anyone in the chat would like to ask questions 
about this? About part four. But I can see that everyone's here. So they have I can go through this. Should I go through this very quickly? Yeah, I think so. I think we'll okay. this is just a piece. Um yeah. I'll go through it very so, fast. We I think I think we're we're all very happy to hear you do it. Uh, <laughs> not rushing through it. We, you don't need to rush through it. So. Normal speed. Okay, this is just a piece. I mean, it's very interesting. So there are these fundamental questions. What can you copy? If, you know, what do you move from one language to another and under what circumstances? You know, well, people have talked about this for a long, long time, what gets borrowed. Um, so possibilities would be just vocabulary or, I mean, sort of the traditional notion was, okay, Sometimes all you do is borrow vocabulary, okay? But if you have really more intense contact, you borrow vocabulary and maybe the grammar that's attached to it. So for example, in English, um, we have um, plurals, like we say phenomena instead of phenomenons because we know about the Greek plurals. So you might do that, okay? Um, some, so people have, have put these on a scale and said, okay, first you borrow vocabulary, maybe a phrase now and then, um, then maybe if you borrow these words, maybe you're, you're bilingual and so you bring those, those uh, sounds in and we know that's happened in English, like we say rouge in English and we say garage in English and those sounds weren't there originally. Um, something if you're bilingual that does get passed back and forth is prosodic structures and intonation and that's really interesting. Now we can study it because we have the tools for it. Um, and we know there are cases where people have borrowed word order. So maybe, you know, you started out SOE and you end up SVO. Okay, maybe inflectional morphology. Okay, if you look at North America, what's shocking is there's not very much borrowed vocabulary, but there are extensive aerial concentrations of sounds, as you saw, and phonological and grammatical patterning. And it's quite interesting. Um, so this is something kind of interesting. This borrowability hierarchy, you know, you're thinking about accessibility to consciousness. And this is, you know, highly conscious. That's not conscious at all. We're looking at California. So there are some 20 different genetic groups. So, and this is, this is a misleading map. This isn't my map. Um, some of these are separate languages like Konkao and Maidu are separate languages. This is a family, Pomo, and it's got seven languages. Chumashin, that's a family, it's got seven. Salinan, that's a family with two. But Chemawevi is a language, Kawiya is a language. Okay, so, but you get the idea. There's lots of stuff going on here. Um, you've seen Central Pomo. Okay, you saw these mean manner prefixes. Here are some of the stuff, you know, you saw some of this. I didn't put all of them on here. Now, we're just looking at California. So these Pomoan languages are related to each other, but the others, they're not related to others, as far as we can tell. What about Kruk? It's got prefixes. Look at these things here. Let's look at Atsugewi. I just kind of took things from different. It's been classified with Achumawi as Palinahan. These are all prefixes. <laughs> There's a lot of them. <laughs> and we know about them, thanks. Tell them, tell me. These are prefixes. Okay. Yana. Okay. From Sapir. I'm not giving you all the forms. <laughs> so you can see the idea is pretty similar. They're not exactly the same. Here's uh, human, this is down in the south. Sorry, I didn't, uh, yeah, there's, these are human languages down here. Um, okay, in a senior two mash, this is two mash, not related at all. <clears throat> Okay, Maidu, not related. <laughs> Where Maidu? This is Roland Dixon. How about Klamath? This is Oregon, not down in. 
Scott knows about Klamath. This is from Scott Delancey. Okay, Takelma, that's in Oregon too, from Sapir. Sahaption, that's Oregon and up into Idaho. This person is in Idaho. <laughs> it's very rich. Okay, Yuki and Wap. Oh, those are related to each other, probably. We're not even totally sure. It's very remote. Um, Wapo, Yuki. Um, now, we've got this giant, you mentioned this before. This is uh, this giant family. You can see it goes down into Mexico. It goes pretty far over into Oklahoma. Um, yeah, okay, from Idaho to El Salvador, California to Oklahoma. And there's these men are prefixed but just in one branch of the family. And that's in California, Oregon, Idaho. So the same area. So here's Kawaisu, this is Udo Aztecan. Yeah, okay. So what's going on here? Well, we know that bilinguals easily transfer vocabulary. They easily transfer phonology. They easily transfer idiomatic expressions, but prefixes. And the point is that in all of these things, none of the prefixes match in form. So nobody said, okay, here's my ma prefix. I'll use my ma prefix over here. The forms don't match at all. They're totally random. Um, but bilinguals can transfer a propensity to talk about certain things and to specify certain distinctions. Um, now, compounding. Okay, it looks like these means manner prefixes um, constructions were descended from compounds. Okay. And it's easy. Everybody has compounds. It's easy. I'm not everybody, but it's very easy to start compounding. I mean, we even see, you know, I think we see English compounding effects on French. Um, you know, you can, you can sort of, if you, if you compound in one language, it's not a big deal to start compounding in the other. Okay. And most of these language families show compounding. Okay, so Central Pomo has some compounds like Kemeneo is the way you say to dance. That's like song or dance, and that's by stepping um, place. Okay, Ma'a -a one, that's how you say to eat. Ma'a is food, and that ka is by biting. You also get it on like pink, you know, shears and stuff. One is to go along. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, I like this one. Smaknot. That's to snore, that's literal, that's a noun sleep, and that's a verb to growl. Those are really compounds. They're sort of pronounced together. You know, Aztecan has um, noun verb compounding giving you a verb, verb verb compounding giving you a verb. So here's kawaisu, um, hand stir is to stir by hand, and you've got this noun, okay? You've got, um, and you've got tumpisa uh, shoshoni, same thing. Um, you look at the prefixes with the hand, and you can see that goes back to a proto udo aztecan noun. So you can see this stuff coming from compounds, sometimes from a verb, sometimes from a noun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and most of these still survive in modern Numic. Numic is this branch in California. So if you've got this or origin in compounds, it explains the thing. So you, you, this kind of explains why these prefixes would have such concrete meanings because they're young. They came from things which, you know, hooked on while they were still kind of nouns, okay? Um, and it can, you can see why there's so many because you can compound like crazy. You've got all of your nouns to pull into these compound constructions. You've got the whole inventory of nouns. So sure, why not? Um, and when you compound, the, um, you, you haven't specified the role of the noun in the verb. So famous examples are English, um, English has lots of these examples. You know, what are alligator shoes? Well, are those little shoes you put on alligators, right? Well, no, um, you know, they're shoes made out of alligators, anyway. Um, so it's no surprise that the meanings of these prefixes are kind of vague as to what they're doing. Are they instruments? Are they environment? Are they means? Are they, well, it's kind of vague. Um, and of course, it's very easy to copy compounding constructions. 
So it looks like this comes from very early, really old, old um, bilingualism, multilingualism, where people copy compounding and then maybe on their own or maybe in contact with others, they started shrinking the initial nouns. So in sum, finally, that's the conclusion. <laughs> Um, there's some central Pomo language learners, the younger generation, they're lively folks, and that's the territory. So that's the end. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Marianne. Um, Marc, uh, who is the, the live stream um, um, organizer or <laughs> Uh, has tried to make people react in the chat and ask questions. Um, and we don't have other questions so far, although still many people are watching, all of them. So maybe if I can ask you a question, um, which is quite a vague and question, but um, I was wondering if poetry in those languages had some special um how can i say that if if it reflected in some ways um the various uh ways the various grammars of those languages is there anything in poetry that is specific to those languages because of noun incorporation or because of uh, polysynthesis and so on oh that's a really nice question and i think there's a lot that remains to be discovered. I think <clears throat> there's a whole lot we don't know. Um, <clears throat> you don't have, in the languages I work with, as far as I've seen, um, you don't have sort of standard European style um, poetry where you know, you've got rhyming on the end because <clears throat> you've got all of this sort of final morphology. So you know, if you've got uh, seven syllables and they all end in the habitual suffix ha, <laughs> Uh, you know, it just doesn't have the same effect. So um, I haven't really seen it, but um, I think I think there's some, and probably new speakers are going to start coming out with it. On the other hand, I've seen phenomenal sort of um, <clears throat> oral artistry where um, an oratory, um, in fact, the first Europeans who were really in contact with Iroquoians remark on their oratory. And now still today, there are ceremonies which last a week and speeches which last, go every day for hours and hours. And it's, it's absolutely stunningly beautiful. It's ornate and, 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 there's old stuff and there's new stuff in there. Um, in some of the, the, the traditional ceremonies, you have a speaker who speaks, I mean, just for hours, and then there are men sitting behind him. And if he gets to a point where he, what's the next? One of them very quietly reminds, it's a little bit like, um, like Homer, where you have these recurring things and people know these pieces of speech. Um, but it's verbal artistry on every level. So it's, it's ceremonial artistry like that. It's um, uh, diplomatic artistry. And it's sitting around the table, having good times, having people make wisecracks. People, these guys are just so amazing. I mean, puns and wisecracks and stuff. I mean, you saw the, 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 the little children in the big plates, but just kapow, 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 kapow. It's wonderful and I suspect that every one of these languages has very different kinds of artistry. Um, and it's out there waiting to be discovered. But of course, to discover it, it means we can't just keep asking people, how do you say, John hit Mary? Oh, yeah. Thank yeah. you so much for making this point, uh, to this very important point about um, having uh, languages as, as they are spoken in context and in, in natural situations, which I think is really, which I also think is really important. Um, so I'm reading the few comments from the chat. Um, so we have uh, Noemi de Pasquale who says, thank you for this wonderful talk. Alex Francois, I've been enjoying the discovery of so many facts of North American languages, which indeed appear to be very diverse. Many thanks to Marianne for explaining complicated systems in such a clear and lively way. But a last question from Tom Durand, sorry. I'm just uh, 
um, unfolding the chat uh, as I'm talking. So last question, what do you have in mind concerning alignments of North American languages like split intransitivity or hierarchical alignment? Any new discoveries or new food for thought? Sure. Um, so this is meaningful to people who are linguists and not at all to people who aren't. Um, so um, I'll, I'll tell you right off the bat that um, this term split intransitivity really um, is, is often exactly the wrong term because these are um, in North America and a lot of other places. Um, I, I should, I should, it refers to what I was mentioning where, where if I say, you know, I jumped, I have a one form for I, and if I say I slept, I have a different form for I. Um, and so people have said, because they're, the, okay, this is for linguists, the point of departure has been Dixon's A, S, and O, so what do you do suddenly when you've got this? And so they said, oh, well, the A, S, and O still fits, it's just this S that is the subject of intransitives, you've got two variants. That's not the way these systems work at all. You don't have AS and O, you've got a very different organization of the systems. So if I say, um, uh, do you remember me? Okay, um, that's transitive, but those are both grammatical patients because maybe you do, maybe you don't, and I'm not an agent, I'm not in control. So there's no subject there, there are two patients or, um, oh, I forgot my purse, you know, I'm a grammatical patient, or I mean, all kinds of things. So um, I think a lot of times things that have, that have been called split intransitive, they're not split intransitive at all. They're very, very different. They're agent patient systems. There's a related system called an active stative system, and it's actually very rare. Sometimes people have thought that agent patient systems were active stative because they've heard the term. Active stative would be built on aspect and Guarani is like that in South America. So if you have say um, perfective or an act, you know, if you have an active verb, like I jumped, you've got one form. And if you've got a stative verb, it's long, you've got a different form, but it's based on aspect. In North America, there's one language that would be active stative, but all the other ones, and there's, I, I didn't give you a map of uh, that there's aerial stuff for agent patient stuff, which is quite interesting. It's something that we can see has spread. Um, there are agent patient systems, they're not active stative and they're not split intransitive either. <laughs> Thank you for that question, Paul. Um, for hierarchical systems, I won't go into that same detail, um, but um, they're interestingly different. Um, so you have one kind in Algonquian languages, you have, other kinds in the Pacific Northwest um, and, and in Northern California, and then still other stuff going on elsewhere. Um, so for example, um, in the Pacific Northwest, in some languages, this is aerial. Um, so you get it in Wakashin and, and Salish and, and um, Chumakwin. If I, if I wanna say, um, I, 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 touched her, I can say I touched her, I, her, but I can't say she touched me because if I've got a third person, this woman over there and me, a first person, I've gotta be the subject. That's the only way it is. So I'm not going to say she touched me. I have to say I was touched by her. And that's a hierarchical system. So you have a hierarchy of either first, second and third persons or very often first and second and then third. And so, you know, <laughs> the subject has to be the top one of whoever's in, involved. That's one kind of hierarchical system. And we can see it spreading sort of dialect by dialect where people start out sort of, it's something you naturally do, you know, like I like to be the subject if I possibly can, the world is about me. So first person subjects are more common anyway. Um, and so you see this usually what happens is people start passivizing a lot. So you can see the passive morphology. And then at a certain point, kids are born and they say, okay, if it's third person acting on first person, I just use this passive construction. They don't think of it like that. But yeah. Yeah. That was a quick and dirty tour, Tom. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, there's also uh, Maria Flaxman who asks, do they incorporate imitative onomatopoeic words? And thanks for the talk. 
Oh, thank you. Um, incorporate what kind of words? Imit oh, imitative. Sounds. Oh. oh, sorry for the pronunciation. So, Im imitative or not? Yeah words oh thanks that's a really interesting thing i haven't seen it um but i i mean i've seen plenty of sound symbolism and that kind of stuff in these languages i've never seen that but that's because in the languages that i know of that i worked with those things haven't become nouns and you can only incorporate um in the languages i know a formal noun so it has to be a real formal noun? Um, that's a really interesting question. So there are, of course, languages like, especially in the Amazon, where, and some of you probably know about languages like this, where um, sound symbolism and imitative stuff has really entered the grammar to such a point that you really have things that are real nouns. Um, and it would be interesting to see whether, if you happen to have that overlapping with incorporation, whether that can happen. That's a really interesting question. So maybe somebody can figure that out. Oh, yeah. And she thanks you for the talk. And also Alex says, Alex Francois, Marianne's style makes us feel like we are right there in the field with her among weasels and alligators, experiencing <laughs> the magic of polysynthesis noun incorporation in their full expressive power. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Merci Alex. Merci Amina. <laughs> And uh, the most important question by Tom Durand says, he says, which First Nation makes the best meat pies? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It depends where you are. <laughs> <laughs> nice question. <laughs> Diplomatic answer. <laughs> yeah, and he also says active stative and agentive patientive better. So I suppose this is uh, you answered that already. Uh, Fanny says, thank you very much, Marianne, for sharing your knowledge with such humor. Any references about humor in wordplay in North American languages? And thanks to all who organized this talk. So maybe, I don't know if you have references right now or otherwise we can give them later. But that yeah, was- Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll put that up. I'll put yeah, that yeah, up. yeah, that was also like a smiley kind of thing. Uh -huh. Steve Hewitt, the little I have looked at Lakota, the system looks incredibly like Georgian agentive patientive. Yeah, it's, um, it's not as complex because you don't have all of this jumping around with aspect. So <laughs> it, stays, it stays put. Um, what's nice about the Suen stuff is that um, you have separate slots in the morphology for agents and patients. So it's not one of these systems where you can only have one patient or only have one agent. So um, you do get, yeah. So I would say it's like Georgian, but it, it's not as tricky. <laughs> um, but what's very interesting, I think, is, again, this stuff is lexicalized. So it doesn't, it means that it, for all the languages I know that do this, <clears throat> speakers aren't deciding moment by moment how agentive somebody is. They just happen to know that um, <clears throat> this verb requires this kind of a thing. So an example, um, which I think is very interesting, is that the verb to work in Iroquoian languages requires a patient pronoun. So if I say I'm working or he works, you use a grammatical patient. You see, that's really, really weird. If anything was gonna be agentive, you would think it would be working. But what's very interesting, if you look all over North America, words for work have interesting histories. So all through California, they're very obvious loans from Spanish. And of course, in the Northeast, Iroquois weren't borrowing words. But I think this is just my idea. We can't ever know for sure. I think the idea of separating work and leisure was not an original idea. You, you lived, you did what you did. And work only came in when Europeans came in and hired people. And so this meant you were working for somebody, you were busy. And so the, the Iroquois verb comes from something like being busy or being employed to be busy by, by somebody. Um, and what's interesting is that speakers, you know, they do it right. I mean, they say, you know, I'm, I'm working and they use the patient. None of them ever said, wait a minute. However, I was talking to this little three-year-old girl. She was a first language Mohawk speaker. It was a real thrill. She only knew Mohawk and we were, we were coloring and we were playing. And I said, so what are you doing? And she says, I'm working. And she used an agent prefix, which I thought was really stunning. Anyway, yeah. 
Beautiful. And um, um, so we, we have questions coming and coming. <laughs> Are there noteworthy cases of variable affix ordering in North American languages? Uh, yeah, certainly. Um, so I, I was a um, Eskimo Alio for sure. Um, certainly not, certainly not Navajo, not Diné. Um, I mean, sometimes, you know, they'll have different ordering in sister languages because um, they, the affixes were sort of rare and they got solidified in different places. Um, so there are some. Um, I'm not jumping, you know, Muscogean, they're pretty well situated. Um, yeah, yeah, Suin is, is pretty solid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Steve Hewitt says, that's right, in Georgian verbs are stuck in their agentive patientive class, but do not always conform semantically to that today. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think there aren't any more questions for you. Um, so I knew, Marianne, that your talk was going to be brilliant and thrilling. <laughs> So, and exciting. So, um, no surprise there, but uh, great joy and uh, excitement at, at uh, what you told us today. I'm sure everybody enjoyed it very much. So, thank you. Thank you very much. We're so grateful for that. And um, many thanks also to all of you who watched and uh, interacted in the chat. And um, let's meet again then next Thursday at 9 a.m. Uh, so it's a different time again because we're, we'll be listening to or be, we'll be watching someone from Auster Australia, <laughs> Professor Nicholas Tieberger from the University of Melbourne, director of the Paradisec Archive, who will explain how we can preserve records of all those extraordinary rare and precious languages of the world. So see you next Thursday and many, many thanks again, Marianne, for a beautiful talk. Thank you for organizing it. <laughs>